Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for your patience. We're ready to start. I'm Jill Orhan with the Red Team Village. I just want to say welcome to our inaugural year. We're so happy to see so many of your faces here. Without any further ado, please let me introduce Joe Gray and also Adrian Sanabria to here to talk with you about the Red Team Framework. Woo! I guess we'll get started with uh, Adrian. All right, yeah, so I've, I've done some pen testing. I was actually involved with the uh, PTES, with uh, putting that together. It's one of uh, a bajillion people that, that contributed to that. And, um, and part of the reason we're here is we never really finished that work. Like, we had a lot of ideas uh, that never got implemented. It was one of those things where when you've got so many people involved with it, like once that momentum goes away, it just everybody moves on with their life and does different things, and and there was still a lot of work to do there, and um, also uh, you know worked on the defender side and uh, uh, studied the industry, you know, so I've I've really seen this industry and the and the job from all angles at this point. <clears throat> so about me, I'm a senior security architect. Um, 2017 DerbyCon. Uh, social engine capture the flag winner, member of the password inspection agency CTF team, uh, third place uh, last year and this year at uh, Nolagon, uh, second place this year besides Atlanta. Um, currently under contract to write a social engineering and OSINT book with No Starch Press tentatively titled Securing the Human Element. So we have all these frameworks. Why do we create a new framework? Well, I mean, why would you create a new framework? Yeah, and I think the key for me is is that uh, a lot of stuff isn't working the way it should be working. You know, it's it's the way we do a uh, a pen test. You know, we hand off the results and we don't really talk to the client after that. You know, maybe we do a thirty minute uh, uh, chat with them just to make sure everything went okay. But I'd say nine times out of ten, they haven't read the report before we've done that, and uh, and and there's really no improvement cycle with pen testing. And what we've seen happen over the years is that it, it you know, ends up being the pen tester having a good time with the customer's vulnerabilities. And uh, which led me to come up with the term vulnerbating. But um, I, I've actually seen pen testers request to extend the pen test just so they could get an exploit working. There's zero value for the customer in doing that. You know, just, you know, good enough Yes, maybe somebody better than me could exploit it. Move on, you know. But uh, I think the that lack of focus is is part of the reason that we're doing this. Let's coin that term, the technical Tarzan. By the way, technical Tarzan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so with this, we're going to use a few terms: red team, purple team, blue team, um, pen testing, vulnerability assessment, web app testing, uh, and and. and you know, I, I, I did a series of talks last year called uh, It's Time to Kill the Pen Test. You know, it just, just I don't really think it's time to kill the pen test, but, it, you know, it was intended to start a conversation and, and get perk up people's ears. But in preparation for that, I asked people what these terms meant to them and, and got just about as many definitions as people that, that answered the question, uh, especially with pen testing. You know, and I was shocked to find how many people, when you say pen testing, uh, they think web app assessment. When you say pen testing, they specifically think web apps, which if you're an older school guy like me, I turned 42 days ago, um, you know, you, you think network pen testing when, when I hear somebody say pen testing. You know, and web app is always something, like a web app assessment is so far from a network pen test. Uh, totally different tools, different skills, usually different people doing it, you know, if you, if you do each one. Uh, so, so yeah, we've got a big gulf in just terminology and language and what people mean when they say words. Absolutely. And, you know, in this industry, especially with people giving talks, and I'm not going to hate on other speakers, but, you know, oftentimes we run into people who, I'm a red teamer, I'm a red teamer, but all they do is consecutive pen test, consecutive vulnerability assessment. They are using offensive red techniques, but it's not true red teaming in terms of, it is um, more uh, domain admin oriented and less objective oriented. So um, let's get into what's wrong with this dichotomy. 
Yeah, and, and, and what he just said, I mean, that's um, that's a good point there. You know, I, I, I had one client that was just so frustrated. They had gone with three different very well-known pen testing companies and said, please hack our Linux stuff. Nobody goes after our Linux stuff. They just go after DA. They go after the Windows uh, stuff. And... Um, and they're just so frustrated they couldn't get anybody to go after it, you know, because in the, in the pen testers' mind or red teamers' mind, like it's a win lose situation. You know, they want to win. It's like like playing a CTF. You know, you go after what gets you the most points. But in reality, you know, the customer wants something. You know, fairly. You know, I mean, yeah, if it's objective based and it's easier to go through Windows to get to the goal, sure. You know, but when the client says forget about the Windows stuff, go after Linux, and you still go after DA, that's a problem. Um, just, uh, just for my curiosity, um, who, here, who in here is a pen tester? Or does some kind of, some kind of pen test, something that falls under that blanket? And defenders? Okay, and uh, what, what, what else do we have in the room? Just trying to get an idea of like what- Compliance. Level. Compliance, okay, sorry man. <laughs> hey, I mean, security is a spectator sport sometimes. I, I, we didn't intend to out you. I, I, I say that because my day job is actually a compliance job too, so. Okay, cool. No, that, that's a good balance though. I was almost, that was like 60, 40 pen testers. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I, I would just venture to say there's a lot of the reason behind that is there's no Mimi cats for Linux. Yeah. I mean, somebody should like make Mimi dogs or Mimi penguins. So I don't know if you can see this from the back of the room, but um, but generally, you know, part of the reason I put together that that uh, that talk, "Time to Kill the Pen Test," last year is I felt that the design was fairly flawed. Um, not only is it not an indicator of an organization's risk, you know, because I mean, they're, they're, especially a large bank or something like that, it, it's just uh, best effort. You know, you got 20 hours, 60 hours, 80 hours to do the pen test. There's stuff you're never going to touch. There's stuff you're not going to get to. I mean, uh, to, just to interject, you can't get an understanding of the environment to actually make the informed decisions that a well-informed, a well-executed um, adversary would do because depending on which industry report you trust, you're going to have a dwell time of three months to seven years. So you're not going to find out enough in 40 hours to be able to do anything of that magnitude. Or the flip side of that is you have a better understanding after 20 hours on the network than, than the people that are running it, well, which is, which is, uh, which is a, a different issue. Um, and, and not because they don't spend time with it, because they don't look at it from the perspective that you do. You know, they've never run Nmap on their own network. So, you know, you're finding stuff that's, that's just never occurred to them to look for. Um, also, it doesn't simulate adversaries. You know, how often do we, do we launch ransomware, simulated ransomware? during a pen test. That's what's actually hitting people, you know, or sending uh, BEC emails, you know, trying to convince them to move money from one account to another. We're not actually using the attacks that are impacting people when we do a pen test. Instead, like pen test has become its own kind of isolated thing and, and, and red team where, uh, you know, we use the social engineering toolkit because it's there. You know, it's, it's good, it works. You know, but we're not approaching it from the standpoint of, okay, what would the bad guys actually do? Sometimes because those tools don't exist or it's just not easily feasible to do that during an assessment, like running ransomware, which I, I think we actually absolutely should do. Yeah, I love that uh, an NCC group client um, actually asked for them to make a neutered version of WannaCry and run it in their environment. Like, I, I think that's something that everybody should be doing because it's what's hitting them. Absolutely. I mean, you can easily, uh, in various languages, uh, web-based like JavaScript or even a compiled language, um, execute functions that would actually copy the file and attempt to encrypt it. Because, let's be real, you don't need domain admin to wreak havoc. Can you send an email to yourself? Can you send an email with an attachment to yourself? Can you install something? Or, you know, can you encrypt a file? Can you change a file's permissions? Those are all things that could be far more devastating than DA. If, if you, I mean, if I can get to your crown jewels and email them to myself, who cares if I'm DA? I've got everything I want. I'm going to cripple your business. And the other thing we have to understand about, about red teaming pen testing is that uh, as a business, logistics play a part. 
you know, if the guy who's really good at A, B, and C isn't available because he's doing another engagement somewhere, somewhere else, you might get the junior pen tester. You might get somebody who's less experienced. Or you might have somebody doing a web app test for the first time. They're not going to tell the client that, but that's who's available. You know, there's a calendar. Everybody else was busy. Um, you know, you, you're getting one person in their particular skill set. You know, so consistency is super difficult with, with this kind of thing when you have one or two people doing the assessment. And it tries to prove and disprove, what do I mean by persistent negative here? Uh, so it's the idea that you could do perfect on a pen test. Pen tester comes in, doesn't find anything, you're fully patched, and you can still get popped tomorrow. That organization can still have a breach tomorrow because uh, it's never going to, this assessment's never going to cover 100% of things. You know, so it, it creates this false sense of, uh, of accomplishment or security. And I mean, just to summarize the last two bullets, I mean, it's inefficient. Uh, back to Adrian's point, you're only going to see a small segment of, the th of what could be done. You may be focusing on web app when someone's coming through and you've got RDP open. Uh, or you don't implement training and someone paid me and I'm fishing everybody or calling people, something to that effect. I mean, it's not efficient, but at the same time, it doesn't make money for companies to admit that they are not the end all be all. I mean, for the first time I went to the vendor floor of Black Hat this year and I mean, it was all advanced, persistent, um, blockchain enabled, AI, ML, military grade, um, super whamadine, synergistic um, garbage. So, I mean, there's no money in admitting that you need a relationship with a feedback loop such as like UDA um, that can actually take something like this into account, look at true business objectives, things that could impact your business and actually confront the problem head on because it, it, it's kind of like one of my complaints with like the medical industry. We're all about symptom management. Here, take these pills. You're good, but the side effect of that pill is going to make you come back three months later. Oh, you need you need this, you need this, and it's symptom management. It's not trying to find a cure for the problem. Yeah, yeah, and root root cause. That's that's definitely and, and some, you know. So so I would like to say I've seen huge improvements in pen tests uh, over the last five to eight years. You know, you you do see a lot more reports getting into the root cause of issues, which is often in people and processes. Uh, whereas, you know, the traditional pen test report would just say missing this patch, you know, had that vulnerability and uh, the customer ends up fixing the symptoms of the problem rather than, you know, why was that patch not installed in a timely manner in the first place? Why were those vulnerabilities present and not discovered? So one of the things I, you know, the, the company I started started experimenting uh, with this a lot. It, it doesn't exist anymore since uh, I've been acquired and stuff. Long story. But... Um, we said, you know, so speaking of inefficiency, that, you know, two parts of a pen test that just don't have a lot of value for the customer. Uh, running some kind of vulnerability scanner, you know, or, or whatever tools you run to gather the data in the first place to figure out what you're going to go after. Uh, that's a huge chunk of time that you're charging the customer for. And then on the back end of that, writing the report, another huge chunk of time. So you got this little bit in the middle that's actually doing the pen test. And in some cases, I, I, I've seen that's as little as two to four hours of actual work on a 20 to 40 hour engagement that you can actually call pen testing. You know, so I started thinking, how can we expand that? How can we get rid of these two inefficient bits on the, on the uh, front end and on the back end? On the back end, the reporting, a lot of that's automation. A lot of companies are doing a great job on, on automating as, as much of the pen test writing as possible. Um, you know, some even using portals, you know, where there's no Word doc, no PDF, but, a, you know, a nice portal where the results go, you know, great work being done there. But on the front end, I thought, what if I just use your scan when I come in? You know, you're doing scans already. What, why am I going to run Nessus, you know, and, and you pay me to run Nessus for eight hours when you've already got them completed? And 100 percent of the time I found misconfigured scans. And I'm like, well, there's part of the problem right there. You know, I found in, in one case they were scanning all their web servers and somehow in how they copied and pasted the domain names into it, uh, M was missing from .com on all but one of them. So they were getting just enough results that they thought the scan was working, uh, but didn't notice that 
13 out of the 14 websites weren't getting scanned at all because of a typo. I would say there's a business in Colombia that's probably mad about that too. Yeah, yeah, a business in Colombia, yeah, .co. But, um, but yeah, that, that's huge. Like, why aren't we checking to make sure that they, they're running a scanner correctly in the first place? We're going to come in and do a red team? It's like kicking a baby in the face to teach it martial arts. Like, it's, it's, it's pointless. <laughs> that's not how you learned? So basically, in that, let's look at the contrast of pen testing versus red teaming. So uh, the pwnage-based part of a pen test, that's that whole technical Tarzan mentality of users are stupid, I'm super lead, I'm going to come in, I'm going to bulldoze you, and I'm going to give you a report, and you're going to enjoy it. And that's about it. Um, pen tests largely, as of late, have become a tool for compliance. Uh, the second that PCI mandated that p pen tests are required, then vendors started salivating and it's like, how do we commercialize this? So as a byproduct, I mean, you can go out there and find companies that are going to give you excellent, in-depth, thorough pen tests. You're also going to find what John Strand refers to as the pen test puppy mills. Um, and ultimately- It's a cash cow, why not? Well, okay. exactly. So that's one of the big problems in changing the industry is, is you know, people are going to buy it regardless of how good you make it. So. You know, there, there's some of that why bother element to it. Absolutely. And uh, this to uh, I coined a term in that last uh, bullet, the digital melatonin, to help management sleep better at night. Uh, we've had a pen test. We've had some really good hackers coming in and trying to get in. We stopped them in their tracks. Meanwhile, they're missing the APT unit coming in via their exposed RDP because that port was not within scope in their statement of work. Um, so with the red team, you're looking at the specific, a specific actor or uh, a technique or an IOC based on something, and you know, it's based on an objective, something like, I want to see how long it takes my SOC to detect someone coming into our, our enterprise from, a web, from the website, pivoting into finance. That is an objective you can measure with a red team engagement. How long it takes to get DA, or if you get caught giving DA, is not an objective. That's outcome. And that, that's a huge, that's been a huge missed opportunity for years that I see done a lot more. Unfortunately, um, and, and what I'm referring to is detection, like, like involve the incident responders, involve the whole security team in seeing if they can detect the attacks that the pen testers are using. Huge opportunity. I mean, it's either that or wait till you actually get hacked and see how you do. You know, so if you're going to pay the money to do it, you know, have everyone try to detect what the pen testers are, are, are doing. Talk to the team beforehand and say, you know, maybe let, let's pause after each day. You tell us some of what we did and we figure out what we missed. You know, that, and that's part of building this, this loop, the, this cycle where you're actually learning from the pen test instead of, uh, oh, they found some vulnerabilities, we're going to patch those. Um, because those are vulnerabilities too. You know, when, when, they're, <laughs> when they're sweeping the network password spraying and nobody notices, that's a problem. Like that should, there should be alarms getting set off everywhere for that. You know, people should be freaking out. So absolutely. And, and measurement is, as you will see later in this presentation, measurement and detection is one of the key steps within our process. So we're going to go through a few myths that uh, we've heard uh, through our travels and years of experience um, and kind of dispel them. So uh, you want to kick it off? We've probably covered a lot of these. We've, yeah. probably, we've probably touched on a lot of these, so so we, we might want to accelerate through this. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, so so yeah, the digital melatonin. You know, we talked about. Yeah, no, it's it's not an accurate measure, uh, measurement. It's a best effort. It's whatever the pen tester happened to touch. You know, so again, that's the good thing to do coming out of the pen test. You know, wh which IPs. You know, how much of the network were you able to cover? What did you touch? What did you look at really closely? And what did you just skim? You know, try and get some kind of good idea of, of uh, how much your different assets were looked at, which ones were missed. And maybe the next time the pen testers come around, have them focus on the stuff that was just skimmed in the previous pen test. Um, this myth, um, according to uh, Adrian's colleague, Harun Mir, um, pen testers emulate other pen testers. They don't emulate adversaries. And that was from 44Con, correct? Uh, yeah, that was uh, the first keynote for 4-4-Con four, four, four in 2011, he said that. Yeah. 
And here we are almost a decade later. Yeah. It's, it's a good talk. I, I, I suggest checking out the video on YouTube. It's called uh, Pen Testing Considered Harmful. And to think about this, uh, just before we move on to the next myth, um, this is a perfect example of why those of us working in the offensive space need to actually study defensive techniques and what other attackers are doing. So you need to know what the, what your opponent, if you want to use the us versus them mentality or the blue team or SOC, whomever, whatever you want to call them, um, I mean, anything, what are they looking for? They want you to emulate APT29. What are the IOCs associated with that? What are the TTPs? Because IOC, Indicator of Compromise, and TTP are two completely different things. IOC, that's kind of like after you know you fall and break your arm and skin your arm. That's the blood stain. The act of what caused you to fall, break your arm, and bleed out on the sidewalk is the TTP. So understanding that, you need to know, like from the social engineering perspective, what persona are you getting in to do this engagement? How many people in here have played with uh, Infection Monkey? Free tool called Infection Monkey, yeah? Yeah, so I, earlier I mentioned, uh, you know, yeah, if the bad guys are running ransomware through an organization, we should be too. Open source out there, brilliant, easy to set up. All the instructions are on GitHub. I think Gardacore makes it and gives it away for free, MIT license. Uh, but Infection Monkey is basically neutered ransomware that you can just deploy and let it tear through an organization. Uh, you can give it a list of passwords to try. Uh, it, it'll try some common vulnerabilities that are out there to, to spread throughout the network. And uh, it, it's the best thing I've seen to simulate an actual ransomware worm getting into an environment. And great, great tool for, uh, obviously you want to, you probably want to talk about the organization before using that in a pen test, you know, because that's not something you traditionally see in a pen test. But all the clients I ever talked to where I use that tool in an engagement, they're like, yeah, you know, their eyes open real wide, light bulb goes on. Yeah, I'd like to see what would happen if ransomware were in here without any negative results. Absolutely. So yeah, Infection Monkey is a, is a good tool. So... We've been talking kind of about why pen tests aren't as great as we are led to believe, but we're not going to say that they don't deserve a seat at the table. They do serve a purpose in life, if nothing else, for things like HIPAA, PCI, and other compliance uh, frameworks. Additionally, it could be a stepping stone in assessing your own maturity to be prepared for a true red team assessment. If you can't withstand someone coming in and getting DA, then why are you going to go for something a little bit more advanced? So... So again, red teaming, pen testing, similar disciplines, not the same. You could say red methods. I really like this one though. Um, black box testing, honestly, from my perspective and based on insert industry reports here, based on that whole dwell time statistic we've talked about, there's no such thing as a black box internal test. They've got time to look around, they're able to check configurations, look, get PCAPs, maybe even log into your SIM, look at your diagrams. They're understanding what's going on. The only thing you should be considering in this perspective as a black box test, and maybe even not even a black box, probably gray box, would be your perimeter. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to uh, explore options and present options to, you know, for the pen test team and for the, the buyers. Um, you know, uh, understand why they're having it. Like, do they want to scare the crap out of management so that they get budget for something? That That's still a thing these days, unfortunately. <clears throat> unfortunately, you, I, I call it the oh shit moment. Getting to that point where key stakeholders believe that, yeah, there, there really are problems. You know, because there's, there's still this feeling of, <laughs> well, nothing's bad happened. Nothing bad has happened yet. So whatever I'm spending on security right now is, is fine. Um, but, um, but yeah, for, for a lot of pen tests, that's still the purpose of why they're having it, is to try and convince management that, yes, there is a problem. Yes, there are things we have to fix. You know, we, we need more tools. We need more people. Uh, and hopefully the pen test will help us accomplish that goal. So if that's their goal, then, then fine. You know, work with, work with the client to help them achieve that goal, you know, as quickly and efficiently as possible. 
I actually put together a, uh, a, a different kind of assessment I called a, a breach impact assessment. Uh, and I actually designed to do it for free as, as kind of a loss leader, just to, just to show people that they have gaps in detection. Uh, but we'd run a bunch of automated tests that would uh, simulate a uh, um, post breach activity or post intrusion activity. Uh, lateral movement, exfiltration, stuff like that. A lot of that stuff can be totally automated. You can just sit down with them in a conference room, explain what you're doing. We'd go through each of 13 tests. Okay, you know, now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm pulling in zero day malware off the web. So if you have anything looking at the wire for that kind of stuff, this is a test of that. Or I'm exfiltrating data out in, in clear text. If you have any kind of DLP, it should get that. Uh, and, and we had a bunch of gimmies in there, like just grabbing iCar off the internet. like. Somebody should get some kind of alert. Uh, hitting the kill switch for WannaCry. Your MSSP should get an alert. 100% of people's MSSPs failed all 13 of those tests every time we did this assessment. And it was very effective having everyone sitting in the same conference room. They're looking at their phones, waiting for it to blow up. You know, we're going through each of these tests, explaining what each of them does, and, and nothing on their phones, nothing happens. It's very, very effective. and you accomplish that oh shit moment in 60 to 90 minutes versus a whole pen test after somebody reads the report. So introducing the actual red teaming process. Um, this is a 10 step process. Um, I couldn't think of two more steps to get it up to 12. Um, honestly, we could actually go down to eight because retesting and purple teaming would actually be optional. Oh, that Lady Gaga song just hit my mind. The paparazzi. We were talking about that earlier. Um, but anyway, so just to walk through, there we go. Um, just to briefly look through this, um, basically we're scoping, identification of the threat model, baseline security assessment, rescoping, learning phase, execution, measurement, debriefing, and then the optional retesting and or purple team assessment. So during scoping, we're going to talk about the objectives, define success for the client, talk about time, of course, money, um, and then the number of systems involved. And of course, start the conversation about the rules of engagement and what we like, what kind of stuff do we want to utilize. The, the assumption with this would be that most, most customers that would be having this conversation would be in the mindset of, I'm scoping this for a pen test. That's why there's a rescoping phase later where this information is refined. Um, Adrian, do you have anything to add with the scoping? Okay. So with the, the threat model, um, from my perspective, I would say it's going to be, be based on the client base. Who, who is your customer doing business with? What sector or industry are they in? Are they affiliated with any governments? Uh, where are they physically located? What are they doing? That's going to drive your threat model. If you're dealing with a financial services company, their target is going to be a lot different than, say, a manufacturing company. I, I think a lot of these stages, as we go through these, uh, should be should involve the client more than traditionally they would have. Uh, you know, I, I, from both sides, I think threat modeling should be you know should be informed by what's actually happened, what's going on, what could happen. Um, and, and just uh, really useful to, to walk through them with it and talk through them with it because, you know, especially on the pen testing red teaming side, if you don't understand how their business works really well, uh, you're probably not going to understand what they're worried about, what their their own equivalent of threat modeling is. You know, especially if you get into manufacturing and stuff like that. Like I, I I've learned a lot sitting down with clients and, and going through this kind of stuff. So it's it's. Uh, Hugely valuable, even if it's just a one hour, two hour, go to meeting, whiteboard session, something like that. So then we have to assess a baseline security model. This can be derived from the critical security controls. Um, at a minimum, um, I would say to be tall enough to ride this ride, you probably at least need the top five. Uh, and also if you have the top five, it's estimated that you're more secure than approximately 65% of other companies in the world. Um, other things you could look at would be NIST Special Publication 853, um, but you also want to assess, where, is there previous testing? What are you, what are you basing this off of? Uh, what's the vulnerability management posture? If you're not patching things, there's really no sense in doing this. Um, and do you plan on monitoring? Do you plan on executing incident response with this? Um, 
And if you, if you don't have certain levels of maturity, then your money may be best spent elsewhere. I'd say 80, 90% of the defender, uh, of the buyers uh, for pen testing services are lacking the top five, all five of the top five. Um, so y you start to ask yourself, does it make sense to even do a pen test? You know, and, and, and they'll tell you, they'll, yeah, I mean, there's this stuff over here where we haven't even looked at yet. We're not, we're not patching it. We know it's deficient. You know, like they know where a lot of the problems is and what they really, where the problems are. Um, so in a lot of cases, you know, they just need help figuring out how to do some of that stuff. You know, and there's not anything I would, I see a lot of companies, uh, you know, have on the, on the menu of services uh, that fits that. Like, help me do the top five, you know, and then let's talk about a pen test. Like, like what, what is that uh, assessment called? You know, and, and there are companies that do this stuff that just do this general consulting. And, uh, you know, again, uh, experimenting with my own company, what we came up with is uh, what was a subscription service where for, for different rates, uh, you could get four, eight, 16 hours of our time every month. Uh, we would do a baseline. We'd figure out, you know, which critical controls have been implemented. Uh, basically, the maturity of the company, how far down this, uh, down, down this path uh, they were. And we create a roadmap for them. And, you know, we, we wouldn't really hard hold them to that roadmap, but we would check in with them once a month. Uh, they, most of our clients ended up using probably 30 to 50 percent of those hours for incident response related stuff. Uh, we wouldn't fly out or anything, but uh, we'd get on the phone with them, help them understand, uh, you know, walk them through some of the incident response stuff, uh, build a plan for them if they didn't have an incident re response plan. But basically, you know, we found you know, our clients found a lot more value in having somebody they could pick up the phone and call uh, year round than to take that same amount of money and blow it on a single pen test once every year. So for, for that 80 to 90% that has done none of the top five critical controls, maybe something like that makes a lot more sense than, you know, let's do a red team, let's do a pen test. But that's, that's all people know to ask for, so that's what they reach for. So, <laughs> I was going to say, like, if a 64-ounce uh, Coke is the only thing on the menu, guess, you know, I mean, guess what people are going to order? Maybe it's not the best thing for 100% people to, to, to order, but. Exactly. And it, we discussed scoping, so here's rescoping. So we're refining the objectives. We're focusing the scope um, on the following. So we already kind of talked about time and money, but now we're talking about the execution time frame. When do you want this done? Because a pen test, you can schedule that for next week. For this, because of the learning phase that's about to follow this, you can't. Because there's a certain amount of stuff that you're going to need to know to properly emulate that dwell time. So you're going to need that, and you're going to need to refine the number of systems within your scope. There's a good chance it's, it's either going to go up or down. It's probably not going to stay the same. Um, then from that, do they want you to explicitly do something? So are they, I don't like the idea of them confining and saying no social engineering or no web app or none of this, but if there's one thing in particular that really concerns them that they want you to highlight, it's good to get that out. And the other thing that changed with this is, depending on the sector, it may even be worthwhile to solicit input from one of the uh, ISACs, so financial services, energy, retail, any of those, because you have group knowledge of what's going on across your entire industry. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, ISACs are great. You know, I wish they happened sooner. But if there is an ISAC for your, your industry, absolutely. Like, a lot of them have threat intel that's specific just to your vertical, just to your market. And... Um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, someone else is going through the same problem that you're having. They're having the same challenges. And I can't tell you how often I've seen amazing solutions to stuff. And I've asked them, have you shared this with anybody? Like, like this is great. Like, like it's easy, it's quick, 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 it's cheap. You know, it works for your market. You know, you don't have to hire additional people. Like, you should write a blog post or something about, the, ah, my company won't let me, you know. and and you end up running into that over and over and over where people have had to come to these 
uh, eureka moments individually, you know, whereas they, they could have benefited from more sharing. And ISACs kind of solved that problem because uh, most of them are private. You know, you have to be in that vertical, you have to be vetted first uh, to be able to share and, and become members. Um, so, so I like seeing that. And, and there's tons of them now. I think in the early days, there was just a financial ISAC. Um, but yeah, there, there's at least a dozen now that I've seen. Yeah. There's like an aviation ISAC. There's, uh, I think there's a maritime ISAC. Oh, about as many as there are villages. I was just about problem. to say, if there's yeah. a village for it, there's probably an ISAC. <laughs> yeah, probably. probably. So, so after this, we'll set up the red team ISAC. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not what that is. That's not what that is. <laughs> Totally kidding. Um, so with I don't the, know what any of these acronyms mean. We just <laughs> right. Is that what they meant by "that's not what any of this means"? Um, did, did that refer to us? I guess so. Um, so with the learning phase, like I said earlier, depending on which industry you report, there's going to be dwell time. So there's ways you could do this: get data from the sim. It could be data dumped out. It could be just giving you access to the sim as the red team that's actually going to engage in this. That way you can understand what's considered normal because honestly, depending on how detectable you're trying to be, you need some concept of normalcy for your target organization. So you might want to look at previous pen test reports. Might be worth something, might not. Either way, um, packet captures, NetFlow, other monitoring tools, get a feel for what's going on because the adversaries may not be using the same exact tools, but that's ultimately what they're trying to do. They are trying to learn. Um, score diagrams, get configurations. Um, interview the administrators, the security administrators, the network administrators, system administrators, HR, anybody you can interview. Yeah, so this is uh, this was a big thing you know, when we set up that subscription service with clients that we did is is we would just go through configs and just all day long, every day, anytime we looked at a config, we found serious, serious issues. And, you know, just like head, forehead slapping, like, no wonder, you know, you're going to get hacked tomorrow. You're like, you know, it, it, it's worth going through. What's a deny all? So with execution, we're not going to get into telling you how to execute things. You, you already have the, the things on the table for you. Uh, here's three examples of what you could use for technical frameworks to actually perform the execution. Um, we saw this as an opportunity to avoid reinventing the wheel. Um, we're just trying to kind of refine the tire. Yeah, the tire or the car itself to help it go a little bit more smoothly, maybe the shock absorber. Um, I'm not mechanically inclined, I apologize, but basically. Uh, the analogy works. No, no two racetracks are the same. You're going to set up camber and stuff like that differently. No two companies are the same. So it, it's OK if no two pen tests or red team engagements are the same. You know, it, it, it's a custom service. It should be. That's why we have all these APT numbers, because they're not the same. Yeah. yeah. So this is probably the most important slide of the entire presentation. This is getting past that whole. Um, technical Tarzan beating your chest because you're so late and they're so dumb. Great, you got domain admin, you got access. What does that mean to the business? They didn't detect you. Okay, is it because you're so super stealthy or is it because they don't have the capabilities? Kicking a baby in the face. You Precisely. Shouldn't, you shouldn't be proud of that. <laughs> exactly. So these are the specific data points that I would recommend. So time to detect. I'll share a quick anecdote with you. I was doing a phishing engagement against a grocery store chain. When I do mine, I don't use automated tools when I fish. I send them out in batches of six to 10. Um, come to a social engineering talk of mine at some point, I'll tell you more about how I actually do it. Uh, the TLDR is uh, about halfway through I got blocked. At the time that I got blocked, I had a 6% success rate on scoring creds. Well, I checked the stats the next day. I was like, oh, it's gonna be bad again went from 6% to 42%. Because the action taken by the network administrator who blocked me was to forward the email and say, do not click this link. <laughs> With the link still in the email. Correct. And not blocking it going out. So the time to detect for them, I mean, was about two and a half hours. Okay, that's, it could be faster, but it could be far worse. 
And, and, and that's not an isolated case. He actually, he told me this story when we were eating lunch like an hour, two hours ago, and I have the same exact story, except it's, it's even worse than that. It's the network administrator shared it, and seven forwards later, you know, this was a company that hired out, you know, basically, uh, you know, EOD type company, you know, hiring out uh, people to do shady things and shady companies and, you know, stuff like that. Somebody in Iraq opens it and puts in his password twice and we get it. You know, he doesn't have a great grasp of English, you know, and, and uh, yeah, forwarding the, <laughs> forwarding the weaponized emails is, yeah, and, and, and that, that's going to happen over and over and over again. Right. So we also want to look at the quality of the report. Um, the accuracy of the report, and then the efficacy of the actions taken. Because honestly, forwarding an email with a link in it without blocking the link or doing some sort of mitigation, it's not really an efficient thing to do. Uh, and for them, it didn't work out in their favor. So these are all things to be graded on. Um, and then finally, we end up in the debriefing phase that I'll let Adrian address. Sure, yeah. Um... Yeah, and I, I mean, the thing to remember here is, is um, you know, a lot of this should get covered along the way. You know, I think there should be more touch points. Uh, you know, we talked about doing the, the threat mapping uh, with them. Um, you know, some customers, at the end of each day, they might want a debriefing. You know, that, that's not a bad idea. Uh, things are going to phase in the pen tester's mind as well. Um, but definitely, I, I, this is the most important part. And honestly, when I was, uh, for all my years of pen testing, this is the part most often skipped. I would often run into clients at conferences and things like that and say, oh, hey, how are things going? How's it, uh, you know, what happened after we dropped off the, the report? Uh, we haven't even opened it yet. You know, this is six months later. They, you know, other things going on. You handed them a 64-page report. Of course they haven't opened it. It's a 64 page report, you know, like half of that are screenshots. You know, it, you, you gotta make it consumable, you gotta make, make it actionable. Um, and a lot of that, you know, I think getting into the detection stuff helps a lot. Like how could you have caught us? Like what's the obvious things that you could have done uh, that would have busted us along the way? You know, so that this is, I, I, I disagree with you. I think this is the most important slide. <laughs> Maybe we can just compromise and say the whole thing's important. No, it's just like <laughs> Stay tuned after this. We're going to have an MMA match in the hallway. Yeah. Um, but anyway, we're, we're going to get the statistics from that measurement phase and then the recommended actions. And when, because you're emulating an actual adversary, you don't have to go and research everything about how to detect this because you're reading this from a threat intelligence feed to find out you know, what's going on, the IOCs and the TTPs, you can just reference to that and say, okay, well, here's, here's what you can do to remediate that because undoubtedly some vendor has already written a blog post to try to be first to market with it. Um, so, and then the other thing is, I like the idea of a qualitative score. Low, medium, high, uh, I wouldn't say yes or no because it's not a binary thing. Uh, I would say that with the whole actions taken piece that we used as an anecdote, that would probably be like a low or an unsatisfactory. But there's no sense in trying to establish an actual numeric value to it. Stay very qualitative in nature. So high, medium, low, severe, critical, whatever, whatever term. You could go with the traffic light protocol version. Red, green, yellow, blue, whatever. Um, and then here come the optional steps as well. So you can let them retrain, adjust, and retry. Um, you're going to have to be a little bit sneakier about the way you retry because you're still going to have the information. You might need to do another bout of the learning phase. Uh, but they're going to be watching for you, so you might want to like catch them off guard at some point in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, so um, I'm going to well disagree a little bit on that last slide with the, with the qualitative stuff. Uh, so with the breach impact report that we did, um, there were, it wasn't comprehensive, but these 13 specific tests that we would do that simulated attacker actions that they should be detecting, uh, we tell them how many, it, each of them was pass fail. Either you saw it or you didn't. And they're all things that you should have seen. Uh, does that cover everything? No, but these are, all 13 of these tests uh, are common things that you should be able to see, uh, that you are gonna see from adversaries. 
And, and that's one of, the, one of the core problems, you know, we probably should have mentioned up front with, with pen testing, is it's very, very focused on the preventative and, and not the detective. And that kind of shifts the mindset to just spending money, time, and effort on that preventative layer. But then once somebody gets in, you haven't, you haven't trained that at all. You haven't tested for that at all, and you're not prepared for that at all. So that's why, you know, in, in my opinion, you know, so many of the public breaches we see are handled so badly. They haven't thought about PR, crisis communications, uh, how to talk about it, um, how to respond to it. You know, and the, the initial uh, reactions, you know, are, are, are generally the wrong things to do. Try and hide it, pretend that it didn't happen, that kind of stuff. And it just exacerbates the problem. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, you got to think about it. Some of the stuff I think you can score, but, you know, if, it, if it's something that's uh, more subjective, you know, like, like how well do you patch, you know, that's never going to be pass fail. You're always going to miss patches. You know, I think what gets important is how do you handle when a patch is missed? You know, do you have a plan uh, for mitigations for that? And absolutely you should be building to be able to defend an enterprise with unpatched stuff because it's never going to be 100%. Which leads us to purple teaming, which basically would be a red team engagement that may have the red team and the blue team in communication with each other or even in the same room um, in the past with red team engagements. Uh, I talked to Joe Vest. He, he was the technical editor of Red Team Field Manual. And what him and his team did uh, at Menace before they were bought by Spectre is they would start and they would do something. And as they continued through their engagement, they would get louder and louder, creating noise. And then finally, if, if the client didn't recognize it, they would just play Thunderstruck on, through their speakers. <laughs> I'm personally a fan of Rick Rolling, and I was recently just introduced to the Klingon Rick Roll. I like that even better. Because um, you know Rick Astley will loan you any of his Pixar movies but one. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. And uh, another reason that we, this is another reason that we did the, um, you know, the, the um, subscription, the monthly subscription. You know, because, uh, you know, imagine if you're only improving your security based on an annual pen test versus, you know, if you're sitting in the same room with somebody else and, and you've got these smaller constant iterations. So, I mean, we I think ultimately we need the equivalent of, of what DevOps does for uh, building applications and, and writing code, uh, but for security. You know, if we're improving every week, a couple times a week, a couple times a month. Uh, if the attacker and the defender are sitting in the same conference room, you know, and the moment the attacker gets some kind of success, the defender's learning from it and they're fixing it. Uh, and and that, that actually happened with clients when we did that service. You know, they, they would, uh, we'd be going through configs and fixing it in real time with them on a, on a you know, just sharing their screen on a go-to-meeting, something as, as simple and humble as that. Did a lot more than an annual pen test did for them. So here are some supporting frameworks. I mentioned them earlier. These are just links to them. Um, the bottom one, uh, if you can't see it very well, uh, it's from OWASP. I'm sure we're going to share the slides, right? Absolutely. So when we put our Twitter handles up on that slide, <laughs> just make sure you take note of it, because that's where it'll end up. Um, my upcoming speaking engagements, uh, I'll be at DefendCon in Seattle. Hacker Halted, which I have a coupon code for anyone who wants to come for free, uh, you can uh, do it. And then I'll be doing a talk and a two-hour OSINT workshop at the Wild West Hack and Fest. Only thing I have coming up right now is, is Virus Bulletin. Me and Haroon Mir are doing the closing keynote, and it's going to be kind of a, uh, a takedown of shady marketing stuff, Ooh. Like, like, like awards that vendors buy, stuff like that. Sorry in advance for any, any pain that causes. So uh, I'm offering my uh, OSINT training through the OSINTION. I've got some upcoming training environment, uh, training opportunities. I'm going to do in person, um, probably right before Derby, probably right before Hacker Halted. I'm trying to get to Dallas, Philly, and Boston this year. My format is it's a one-day OSINT course followed by a four-hour CTF uh, targeting local businesses. And like I don't mean like your local gas station. I'm talking like OSINT against nearby Fortune 500 companies or publicly traded companies that have enough of a surface that you can collect stuff. Uh, I got stuff coming online. Uh, here's that coupon code to hack or halt it if you want to come in for free. I like free stuff. 
Uh, the keynotes this year, we have Casey Ellis of Bug Crowd, Paul Asadorian from Security Weekly, Jenny Radcliffe from the United Kingdom. Other speakers include Jeff Mann, um, Ginsburg, myself, Marcel Lee. You didn't submit this year, right? Or did you? I don't remember. I did. It didn't get accepted. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oops. That must have been that meeting I missed. Awkward moment right here. I tell everybody to submit. CFP will open up for it again in probably like, I think February. Um, the Recon NG training, I'm offering two two hour Recon NG, uh, NG sessions. It's the version 5.0, the new one. Um, you'll need some API keys. So uh, sign up sooner rather than later if you want to do it. Use those coupon codes. Um, let me get you in cheaper. And uh, I'll get an email to you telling you which. API keys you're going to need. Um, the cool thing is I'm not going to tell you to pay for anything. Uh, the only optional API key that costs anything is have I been pwned and that's $350 a month. So any questions? Yes. So, uh, what role do you feel, yeah, sorry. What role do you feel uh, white carding has uh, in red team engagements? Like being given access to certain parts within a network to more efficiently use the time that you have during an assessment. Do you want to handle it or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, I think that's huge. I think that uh, th this whole assumption of uh, pen test not being legit if you have to earn every step of access, like I said before, it, it's you know an 80 hour engagement. It's a 20 hour engagement. You know, I, I think you're increasing the value when you make certain assumptions. Like let's assume you've gotten in. Let's let's give you an account. Let's, uh, you know, we think somebody could get that far. So why don't we start you off that far? Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's where that breach impact assessment with those automated attacks we did came in so valuable. Because let, let, let's assume the worst has already happened, and you know, could you actually detect it and respond to it in any kind of reasonable amount of time? Yeah, yeah. So no, I th I think that's super important, and we need to get over. No, let's make it super legit and like, you know, because if you want value out of that, all of a sudden you're in like thirty, forty thousand dollar range to have enough time to do that properly. We got a question over here. A couple of them actually. A few. We got a question pod. Thanks, um, so one thing I've noted in the environments I've worked in is that nobody wants to be down uh, or have systems down or impacted that people are actively working on. Do you think there's any benefit to adding systems that are capable of being targeted and actually locked down or infected that are not going to impact their daily operations? Uh, did someone say they couldn't hear? Yeah. Is it, okay. So the question was, is there any um, value added to testing systems that should not be taken down? Um, I'm conflicted with this. Is that right? Mostly. So I'm saying, like, for example, if in an enterprise you were to add systems in each of the different uh, work areas, so for example, if you have a system with SOC that you can actually lock down and run somewhere, same thing in like the HR departments or any of the other divisions that would actually allow the teams to know. Setting up simulations, system. in other words. Oh, uh, actually, it's something that you can employ again and not have to worry about taking down everything else in the problem. Mm. Right, right. But you're, you're, you're setting up systems that are non production, right? Not production, but standard configuration. But standard configuration, yeah. yeah. I, I, I personally like that idea. Yeah. My one flaw that I'm going to see with it, standard configuration. Yeah. Most companies don't have one of those. Well, no, he means the same as the production. I, I agree. As, I, and yeah. that's what I'm, I, I, fundamentally, I agree. So that, this is the whole concept behind, behind um, uh, uh, cyber ranges. The whole idea behind the cyber range is that you you make a copy of production that you can do anything you want to, like like you can uh, do proof of concepts in there. You can uh, test out new products uh, in there. You can do um, uh, anything you want in there. It's non-production, but it's it's a, a very close copy of what production looks like. Obviously, once you get into OT and you get into like SCADA stuff and you know. You, Stuff you can't just throw into a VM that gets a little bit more difficult. Um, but absolutely, as opposed to leaving it untested, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, absolutely, you should do that. Yeah, there's a lot of value in that. Yeah. 
actually, I really like the framework. Now, is there any reason why the framework shouldn't be applied to more than just rate teaming, but include, for example, you know, any customer's reaction to pen testing, compliance check, and what, whatever, you know? Talking about expanding it? Yeah. Yeah, because the, the whole feedback right, is actually yeah. lacking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, forget the word uh, red team, and, and and there is a document that we're working on, um, but yeah, no, it, it it applies to more than just red teaming, and, and it's it's meant to be you know an a la carte menu where you can pick and choose and and customize something out of that. So yeah, if you can make that apply to compliance, you know, and absolutely it does apply to a normal pen test, uh, uh, then yeah, yeah, and that um, yeah that that feedback loop does need to be better defined. Yeah, I agree. Um, I was wondering, based on your experience uh, for the enterprises, um, how often do you think that this red teaming uh, activity should be performed and how long ideally will it take? Time-wise? Yes. Effort? Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on how much you're going to cover, how much you hope to cover with the, with the assessment. I mean, so, so that's, that's a huge problem in that that's, uh, you know, scoping properly doing scoping and uh, somehow calculating uh, the number of hours that you need to do it um, the, it, it is, is pretty tough. I, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Right. Um, but the verbosity of the learning phase would have a lot to do with that as well. And then depending on what the actual objective itself is, that may drive that as well. So. so the problem you run into is you need the kind of details that you gather during a pen test to properly scope the pen test. So you, um, so I, I mean, we've asked people for NMAP scans or for existing vulnerability scans. Let us look at those, and uh, and then we'll tell you how long we need. You know, so I, I, I think that's a legitimate. I, I, and again, that gets into um, what you call it, white carding, white 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 carding. So I mean, you know, they they might object to that, but I mean, uh, you know, the thing is, if you already know the vulnerabilities, you know, you can just help that much quicker anyway. So. Yeah, I think you should start. Well, obviously, you're going to get an NDA in place. Uh, so that's that's the other hard problem uh, to that is you're talking about looking at sensitive data before you've even they've signed the contract, you know, during the scoping phase. So so that that can be a little tricky just with the 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 contract process, just the process of, of getting them signed on. So so yeah, if if you can hack that process where you've already got a contract like in MSA in place and, and an NDA in place before you actually give them the statement of work uh, and insert this phase where you're going to go over vulnerability scans together and, and information about the environment. Uh, maybe even do the, the threat mapping phase before you actually uh, scope and sell the red team. Um, I, I think that's how you have to do it because doing it blind, it, it's going to be wrong most of the time. Either that or make it easy to extend it. You know, tell them, hey, it's going to be between here and here. We might use less money, but, you know, get more time pre-approved or something like that. But it, it, it's a tough problem. Yeah. Yeah, this is more of an observation um, from my experience in this. Um, I run an adversarial team for a Fortune 500 retailer. Um, we do pen testing and red teaming, and most red teaming is pen testing and the market. We talked to a lot of people. There's only a handful of organizations out there that, in my experience, understand the difference between red teaming and pen testing. We outsource our pen testing, and then we kind of do our own red teaming internally. We differentiate the objective-based adversarial assessment. And the best time for a red team is during a pen test. Um, so my experience is blue teams love pen tests. They despise red teams. Um, because they don't know how to catch adversaries. Um, because when you go out there and you talk to red teamers, a lot of times you talk about methodology when you're onboarding them and they talk in it and they go through the whole process, you're like, well, that's a pen test. And they're like, no, no. It's like, mm. I know a lot of guys in the underground who do this for a living in like real life on the bad side. And like, mm, they don't use NMAP. They don't yeah. use vulnerability scanners. So, I said, so if you need a vulnerability scanner, or you talk to your, we ask them their tools that they use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they give us a list of tools, nine out of 10 times, they disqualify themselves. Yeah. It's like, yeah, mm, no, thanks, we're good. So really vet your pen, if you're doing a red team, you need to really understand what the 
differences because there's a serious difference with teenagers. Did you actually have a question, sir? No, I don't really have a question. Would you like to come have up you, here? Have you seen that going on when you doing uh, there you go. Yeah. Do you um, experience, do you, do you see that? No, that, that's insightful. I, I, I think that's fantastic. I, I, I never, <laughs> uh, that, I'm, I'm still, uh, best time to do a red team is during a pen test is still uh, flying around my, my, uh, my skull. I bet you get called a lot of good names by your blue yeah. team counterparts. Yeah. No, but that, it's, I mean, and that goes to, if you go back to that 2011 talk by Haroon Mir, I mean, that's one of his major points is pen testers emulate pen testers, not adversaries. You know, like, like there's this, uh, I mean, there is a methodology to it. It's not really written down anywhere, but it's pretty basic. It's, it's you're going to come in, you're going to run NMAP, you're going to run Nessus or some other vulnerability scanner. And if you find anything juicy, uh, you're going to try and exploit it. And if it, Nessus didn't find it, your pen tester is not going to do it in a lot of cases because they're, they're using that as their guide, which is a terrible, terrible guide. Like most of the stuff that has default creds, you'll never find. You know, like Nessus doesn't look for all those things. Um, That's why you go look at the global asset inventory on Shodan.io. The good stuff I do find in NMAP and Nessus is just where it tells me a web server is open. Like uh, way back in the day, I wrote a script that would take a screenshot of every uh, web interface, web console that I would find. Then I go through that directory of screenshots and uh, and look for config consoles and stuff like that, and that I knew had default creds. You know, all those are going to show up as informational on your vulnerability scanner. Not not with a ten, not with a two, not with a one, with a zero, with informational. So yeah, that, that's that's a really good point. Um, yeah, that's what I think. What's that? DR tests and payload testing. Really good time. Oh man, that's just mean. <laughs> a DR. What do you do with the An actual world? test of DR is punishing enough. I know. I know, but you have to do that if you're really. I like the way you think. What's your goal is test the process. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, Companies started to uh, acquire breach and attack simulation tools. Yeah. Do you think Red Team can depend depend on these tools, or uh, is it no. more of a, red, a blue team tool? Um, yes, I think uh, so. So um, partial answer: I think yes. Uh, attack simulation tools uh, are blue team tools, and I, I think they're huge for the industry. It's the first time we've had any kind of standardized tooling that actually tests all the other products that we're using. Uh, and, and I think that's, that it's hugely important to use that stuff. Some of it, I think it's, you know, I see less value in an attack simulation tool that's uh, cost, uh, you know, six digits and it, uh, you know, you have to hire one or two people to configure it and run it and stuff like that. I think at that point it starts to lose value. Uh, you know, I, th I think it should be pretty simple to do it, um, to, to, to have that value, but, um, Blue teamers need to be able to do what the pen tester and the red teams are doing to be able to even know if they fixed it correctly. Again, think if they're coming in once a year, you only get one shot a year to see if you fix something correctly. That's horrible. Like you, you need to be able to run that test hundreds of times if you need to, dozens of times uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, password spraying, past a hash, you know, that there isn't a box in the network that you fix because it's not... Uh, in the domain, so it's not getting the group policy. Like you need to be able to test yourself and, and find those outliers. At the same time, that breach impact assessment that I mentioned, uh, uh, as uh, pen testers or as, as consultants, we use that uh, one of those tools uh, in our engagements. And I think that's a, that's another good use of uh, attack simulation tools is for pen testers to to automate some of that stuff. You know, because you can just let that thing go, let let it run, uh, and you know, that's more value for the customer uh, where you're not having to build human time to do that. So there needs to be a lot more automation in pen testing, basically. So yeah, good, good stuff. Any, Any other questions? Questions, concerns? Oh, there's one. If you have current clients that are pen test, you know, they want pen tests on, how do you get them, how do you get them to want to do red teaming? What's your, what's your pitch to them? From a social engineering perspective, offer it as a new introductory service for the same price. <laughs> One of the things I'm, I'm going to take away is that you've, you've basically given me permission to 
interact with clients and say, hey, why don't we why don't we get a little more dynamic and change this up and have a conversation at the end of the day? You know, like I like what you said. Um, you know, show me where you detected me, and I'll show you where you know, you missed. Um, I, yeah. I I think one thing you could do with that is <clears throat> commission an internal anonymized. Um, test amongst clients uh, where you ask for specific metrics like was this detected how long did it like what time was it detected um, what steps were taken basically that the measurement phase ask for those compile it into a report and then give it to the customer for free and say hey based on the clients we do business with this is what we've determined based on this in comparison to the DBIR ISTR the yada 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 reports um, this is how our customers collectively stack up. So we are implementing a new thing and here's what it is. And that's, that's the approach I would take. So I, I, I'd, I'd use that breach impact analysis or something that looks like that. Uh, don't actually call it a breach impact analysis, by the way, because BIA is business impact assessment, which is something totally different. And uh, I, I just couldn't find anything else that sounded right that didn't share that acronym. Um, but um, getting that, that, that was part of my goal in changing how, how we did these assessments is getting that oh shit moment at the very beginning. You know, so that's why we intended to do that as a loss leader. You know, we intended it to take no longer than, you know, an hour, two hours. Um, but showing them that an attacker in their environment can do all kinds of stuff without getting detected, uh, I think it's a great motivator to, to sign up for a service like that or to, to do a larger engagement. Yeah. Without having to charge them for an engagement to sell them on an engagement. Yeah. So I think the takeaway is a lot of stuff that would really motivate and convince uh, companies to do more of this type of work can be automated and done really quickly. I mean, we could have gotten it down to where we sent them a link and said, click this link and uh, it'll all happen in, the, in a browser and give you a score. Like it could be automated to that point to where it could be done in like a, uh, uh, ju just a link that you send the client in a web browser. Assuming they open that link while they're on the corporate network at least. <laughs> open it at home too. I think we had one more question. So you have a client that says they have unlimited budget. They, they, they have a limited budget. Oh, a limited. I thought you said unlimited. <laughs> I've, I've got a card. A to limited at the frequency. So I mean that that's why you, the conclusion I came to is don't do monolithic assessments. You know, and and, and we offered a, uh, um, you know, it was a thousand. Uh, what was it? Yeah, 1,000, 2,000, or 4,000. Four, eight, or 16 hours uh, per month, uh, this uh, uh, subscription service that we offered, uh, which is you know, the way a lot of companies' budgets work. Uh, there's a certain amount uh, that you hit where they have to get permission, uh, depending on how, how high the buyer is in, in the organization. Um, and there's a certain amount where, where they don't even need, you know, like, like that's almost petty cash for them. You know, so by making it monthly you know it's an invoice that they sign off on every month like four grand is is totally doable for a lot of these guys so instead of that thirty forty thousand dollar shocker um you know you can do a lot of the same stuff but spread it out throughout the year so that they're constantly focused on security constantly uh improving throughout the year instead of in one big engagement so with a limited budget you know that that's that's a conclusion i came to is is break it up and let them spend that that budget slowly, and they they really do feel like they get a lot more value out of it. I would also consider the business model, customer base, and uh, sector for that as well. So some industries are a little bit more sensitive than others. Like finance, they may want it more frequently because they're attacked more frequently. Um, if it's a large multinational organization, they may need it more frequently than some mom and pop place in Podunk, Montana. Um, so, I mean, everything on the internet, in theory, is 
there's equal scrutiny put to it. But then when you start putting two to two together and you find out who it belongs to and what, you know, what there is to gain from it, then things change. When, when you're working with them all year, I mean, you develop a much better relationship with them. Uh, pe you know, people on your staff know their network as well, if not better than their own people. You know, you become that truly that trusted partner that they turn to for stuff. So you end up getting more and more work out of that anyway. So win-win, I think, with that. We had nothing but positive results from that subscription service. Yeah. Any other questions, concerns, complaints, grievances, thoughts, opinions, or otherwise? That's all, folks.